Welcome everybody back again for an incredible bonus session for you. Last week we had Reed Larson in to uh, to talk about business structures, LLCs, all all these uh, these basic foundational legal things you have to know when starting a business and how those things can affect your uh, your taxes, how it can save you money, how it can affect uh, the liability you're exposed to in your business, the risk of your business. And that session was beyond awesome, um, and uh, pretty much everyone that was on that session said this is one of the best webinars I've ever seen. So if you guys haven't caught last week's session, uh, be sure to jump in the members area or on YouTube. Uh, we have that session up, ready to replay at any time, and it is highly recommended. But, uh, but after that session, we had tons of people just saying, man, Reed Larson is awesome. We got to have him back. So we have him back just a week, uh, a week later. We have him back again. Uh, today we're going to go over bookkeeping and accounting for FBA owners and uh, or FBA business owners. And um, if you saw last week's session, you know that Reed has a very unique uh, perspective on this and a very in-depth perspective on these things. And these are the types of things that honestly uh, I am not the expert in, right? I'm and most of you guys are out there building the businesses and taking risk and doing lots of stuff, and taking action. Um, this is bookkeeping, accounting, your your legal structure. These are those types of things that a lot of business owners just don't think about until it's too late. Um, so today's session, Reed Larson, the co-founder of FBA Prep, is here. He's going to take you how uh, basically the optimal bookkeeping and accounting structure and setup for an FBA business owner. Uh, I think he'll talk about both how you can do this yourself and uh, how you should be keeping your books clean, how you can use your books to make smarter business decisions. Um, and I'm sure he'll also talk about different aspects of this that you can outsource, what should be outsourced, what shouldn't be outsourced, um, and, and things like that. So guys, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Reed Larson. I'm very excited to see this session uh, as well today. We're going to learn how to keep our books clean and how to make smart business decisions uh, based on those financials, those things that uh, are so important but most entrepreneurs uh, never even look at. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, Steve and I will be in the question box today, guys. We'll be answering questions, hanging out with you guys. Um, so feel free to drop your questions in. Uh, either I will get them, Steve will get them, or Reed will get them live. And without any further ado, uh, I will see you guys in the question box, and I'm going to turn it over to Reed Larson, the co-founder of FBA Prep, to show us how to keep our books clean and make smarter business decisions. How you doing, Will? Have Very a great good. Day. Yeah, excited, excited to have you back for another uh, extremely valuable session here. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me again, uh, man. After the last one, uh, you know, we we went uh, we went deep into. LLCs and companies, various kinds, business structures, uh, how we go about you know, making sure that we set them up correctly so that in the future we can sell the business, right? Uh, I mean, everybody wants to have an ac exit strategy uh, or maybe they want to give it to their kids or maybe they uh, you know, want to sell their brand or parts of the business or send, you know, individual products, things like that. And <clears throat> we also talked about liability and other things like you mentioned a minute ago that uh, if you set up your business correctly in the first place, all that stuff kind of falls into place nicely. You minimize taxes, you minimize your liability, and you make it easy to uh, you know, go through with the kind of business that you want to, whether it's on Amazon or in any other sales channel too. So uh, in kind of a tandem with that, alongside that, another big aspect of it is how do I track everything? How do I keep my books you know, what are books? How do I read financial statements? I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that, uh, you know, they just don't teach you in, uh, in school. Um, even if you're, uh, you know, going to school for accounting and things, it's still sometimes, uh, you know, complicated. And I'm going to try and simplify it down to where you can see exactly what you need to be able to make good business decisions, smart decisions, the kinds of decisions that will help your business to prosper. So it's great to see so many people, so many attendees. I'm sure a lot of the people uh, attending today uh, on this bonus session were there last week too and uh, hopefully you've come back uh, kind of for part two of this. And if you have not uh, seen that or you were not there when we did this last week, please do take a minute to go back and, and uh, take a look at that webinar. There was some really great Easter eggs in there, some cool stuff, stuff that I've never uh, shared publicly with others before that I, I I'll tried to you know give as bonus value. By the way, I will be uh, taking questions along the way. So if you have a question as we're going, 
uh, go ahead and type it into the question box and uh, Will's team will uh, answer those and I will answer some of them in the flow of the conversation here as we go. So um, anyway, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming and uh, dive right in with our main questions. Our main questions uh, for bookkeeping in general are how do I know if my business is healthy? How do I know if my product is profitable and how do I forecast future cash needs? Now, <clears throat> forecasting future cash needs is something, it's a discipline, it's something that a business owner needs to do regularly because, you know, frankly, you may have bills hanging out out there that you're kind of aware of, stuff that's going to come due this month or next month or the month after, particularly if you're ordering product from a factory and you got to put down a deposit now, maybe 30% down now, but you can have 70% plus all of your shipping and all of your tariffs and taxes and things to deal with in maybe a month from now or two months from now. Well, you know, you're going to have to make sure that you have enough cash on hand to do it. And for those of us that, you know, in the past used to run our business based on how much money is in our checking account, like I go look at the bank today, you know, uh, <laughs> how much money is in there, um, you find yourself short because you didn't plan for everything. And so uh, that's a, a, a tough space to be in. Now, I mean, 25 years ago when I first started into business, um, you couldn't uh, go online to check your business uh, bank account. You couldn't uh, just check it on your phone. You couldn't do it on your computer. Um, computers were relatively archaic and the internet was just barely getting started. And uh, so, Back then, we had to actually keep track of things on, you know, using a register of some kind, a ledger of some kind, and <clears throat> the discipline of going through and reconciling that, you know, teaches you a lot about how businesses work. But we don't do that anymore, do we? We we just hop online and check real quick because we have uh, the information overload going on. The problem is it's the wrong information, and that's what the issue really boils down to: is that we tend to make business decisions, product decisions, and forecasts based on the wrong information, the stuff we can get our hands on now rather than the stuff that we have to dig for and figure out. So what I'm hoping to do today is make it easy for you to dig for and figure out what you need so that you have the correct information to make the, the right decisions in your business. Uh, I got to tell you, uh, I'll, I'll share a story with you. Um, when I first started on Amazon some years ago, um, we uh, ordered, we, we actually designed these really cool products. It's a giant uh, stuffed animal type product that had a unique twist to it in the marketplace that uh, people really liked. And we had uh, two different designs and we were going to do a third. And, you know, uh, we ordered like a couple thousand of them and then we ordered more and uh, through the Christmas season and uh, New Year's and you know holidays and so forth um, we sold about 8,000 units of that particular product um, some of the blue ones and some of the white ones and I was about ready to place my next order okay now these things were about eight dollars a piece cost and then there was shipping you know to get it to us and taxes and stuff and tariffs and uh, you know we were selling them for around 20 bucks 25 bucks somewhere in that range on Amazon and man we were selling lights out on this thing and so what I had to do was I had to figure out how many to order and you know I worked really hard uh, my partners worked really hard we had done a a tremendous job getting everything ready to go. Uh, we had designed the product, we had launched the product, we it was successful on Amazon, it was selling, it was everything was lined up and we were thinking we were gonna ride this product to new heights of profitability. This was gonna be one of our flagship banner products. And so we were about ready to make a hundred thousand dollar decision. Uh, we're going to uh, buy a crap load of these things and then um, get them made, uh, shipped, delivered to us, put into into inventory, and and uh, hopefully, um, you know, continue to sell through the the existing inventory, the remainder that we had. But 
you know, really gear up for the following uh, holiday season, and maybe we could do 50,000 units instead of just eight, you know. Uh, the gut feeling on it was, wow, this is a in, an incredible product. Wouldn't any of you be interested in a product like that? Wouldn't any of us want a product like that? And the answer is yes, of course. It sounds marvelous. It's going great. We've done everything we need to do, and wow, it's awesome. Except for one thing. When I sat down to make the $100,000 decision, I put together uh, a quick analysis of the product itself and looked at the numbers on it. And I immediately killed it. And we never placed the order, and we did not continue selling that product. And you might be thinking to yourself, why in the world would you kill that? I mean, isn't that what everybody wishes they had? And the, the answer is because of several problems that I discovered when I ran the numbers. The current numbers, the actual numbers. I ran those numbers, and I'm going to show you how to run the numbers the way I do so that you can make a good business decision here. But what I discovered is that we were not making very much money on each one on each unit because of several gotchas that you know we really didn't know about prior to ordering um, so for example one gotcha uh, I'll just tell you that, that they when they shipped them over um, we of course we got they, they came by ocean and we got these things um, into uh, at the time I was running this business out of my garage <laughs> and I know many of you were uh, or are doing that and know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have since, of course, expanded into warehouse space, but at the time, this was in my garage, and I remember getting all of these cases, uh, relatively large boxes, but, you know, they each, each box had 20 or 30 of these uh, or 50 of these things in it, and they were uh, surrounded with these bands, you know, these really uh, heavy-duty straps, and as soon as you cut the strap, the box freaking just exploded. <laughs> and all of these stuffed toys had been so uh, compacted, almost like a, a hay baler or a straw baler or something had baled them together, and they just exploded, and all of a sudden they were five times their previous size. And so that presents a problem when you send something to Amazon because all of a sudden it's an oversized product that takes up a lot more space, and they charge you a lot more money for fulfillment. And so my original numbers were based on how many units fit in a box, in a case, you know, 50 units to the case or whatever. You know, that's not going to be an oversized product uh, on Amazon. But <laughs> once they exploded and blew up, then all of a sudden I had a totally different set of numbers, didn't I? I had to count, account for oversized shipping into Amazon costing more, storage at Amazon costing more and fulfillment by Amazon costing more. So those kinds of decisions when you decide you're going to make a hundred thousand dollar purchase you want to know that. You want to uh, uh, reevaluate the product and do it using all the available information so that you know that you're making a good decision. So it, the, the bottom line on that particular product was we were not making anywhere near as much money as we had forecasted. We were only making like at the end of the day less than a dollar a piece. We were going to tie up $100,000 worth of capital. Um, we were going to buy, uh, I think it was 15 or 20,000 units. And after marketing and everything else, uh, we were going to clear something like 50 cents a piece. Um, so I don't know if you would do this or not. Would you tie up $100,000 to be able to sell 20,000 units and make 10 grand total? Um, especially if you know you're gonna to have to tie it up for a year because we were gonna make this purchase in January and that's the real hot selling season for this product wasn't until the following November so we were gonna to have to store and warehouse the product for a long time and so we decided to kill it we did kill it and we moved on so um, the only reason I'm sharing that story with you is sometimes things look really good on the front end sometimes things feel awesome and you feel like you're having success but on paper you're actually not and that's what we want to uh, avoid, um, you know, continuing a business where you're, where you're not actually profitable, okay? And just to jump in here too, I know there's probably a lot of people right now thinking, how wouldn't you know <laughs> that it's profitable? Um, I, I'll just say this is a problem that I've run into in multiple businesses. Um, not setting your books up correctly and understanding how these financials actually work uh, can really get you in a bad situation where all of a sudden you have a $150,000 tax bill that you didn't know was coming. 
Um, just all sorts of different things that can happen here. Uh, my accounting for many, many years was, well, it looks like there's more money in the bank this month than last month. Um, so uh, once yeah. you get to a point in your business where there's 15 different products and three different suppliers and transactions going in and out every day, although it seems like it would be simple to just go back and clean up your books in the future, I promise you it is a freaking nightmare and you will waste so much time just trying to figure out what you spent a dollar on uh, you know, a year and a half ago. So this is something, I know there's a lot of people right now thinking, man, I think I might be too small to understand bookkeeping. Uh, I can still kind of feel it just with this one product. You'll be very surprised at how quickly you can lose control of your books and lose track of transactions, let alone what transactions apply to which products. So this is very important stuff, guys, because I get a lot of questions from people asking, how do I know what my reorder size should be? How do I know if I should do additional products in this product line or a new brand? Well, it all comes down to reading financial statements and, and making smart decisions based on what the financials are telling you. Uh, this is one of those things in entrepreneurship that you can't really learn on the fly. Um, I have through a lot of pain, but, uh, but P and I'm sure Reed has as well. And that's why it is just so important that you guys really absorb this information today um, because this is stuff that is painful to learn. And if you don't have someone like Reed here telling you uh, what he's learned through that pain, uh, you're going to have to go through that pain yourself. So, yeah, just uh, very, very much into this session right now. And I just wanted to jump in and kind of express my own personal pain um, from not taking this advice sooner. So. Yeah, thanks, Will. You're absolutely right. And, and you know, it, the tendency is we're going to start a business small. We're going to take care of all the details later. We just want to see if it's going to work first. And somewhere in that transition between discovering that it does work and deciding that you're going to go all in and put all your chips down and raid your retirement account, tap your home equity, charge up your credit cards and go for broke, somewhere in between those two places, this is what you need to do, right? You need to you need to know if your business is healthy, you need to know if your products are profitable, and you need to forecast the actual future cash needs so that you don't overcapitalize or undercapitalize your business. In fact, uh, there are three main reasons why a business fails. I'll just kind of drop this on as a little bonus tidbit for you. Three main reasons why a business fails. One is bad management. Two is undercapitalization. And three is growing too fast. And all three of those things can be fixed by good business practices like bookkeeping and business structure. So that's what I'm really hoping to do is help you not fail uh, right out of the gate here, help you be successful. So I want to talk for a minute about each of these three questions. Uh, the first question, uh, of course, was how do I know if my business is healthy? And and so how do we discover that? And the answer is we put proper bookkeeping in place. And what proper bookkeeping includes is monthly reconciliations of your bank account, your PayPal, your, your uh, credit cards, whatever else you have. When I say reconciliation, I mean not just uh, looking at the statement and say, oh, yeah, okay, that makes sense to me. But rather that the information gets entered into an accounting program. Now, uh, QuickBooks is the number one accounting program in the United States. Uh, almost every uh, financial professional is familiar with it or uses it or both. And uh, so, you know, that's what I uh, tend to use. Now, QuickBooks Online is okay. QuickBooks Desktop is excellent. Uh, there's Mac version. There's Windows version. There's enterprise versions. There's uh, multi-user versions, everything you could possibly need. And it's very easy to um, either connect QuickBooks to your bank to automatically pull transactions or to just have them entered in or you enter them in yourself. The process of doing that is important so that you know that the, the records that you have are accurate. And then secondly, reporting. You've got to pull the reports from your various sales channels. So for example, going into Amazon and pulling a sales report that has instructive and meaningful numbers on it so that you know what was actually done. What did Amazon actually charge? What are the real numbers involved? Uh, that's on a product basis or on a company-wide basis. And then finally, you want to take all that information once it's been entered correctly, and you want to have monthly reports. They're called financial statements prepared. And the two main ones are income statement and balance sheet. And today, I'm going to teach you how to read those. I'm going to show you 
some balance, uh, an income statement, a balance sheet, and show you what's on it and how to read it and what a healthy one um, actually looks like. Um, now, um, Lucas is asking, you know, what's the best bookkeeping software for the UK? You know, Xero, X-E-R-O, is really good for Europe um, because it handles all of the currency conversions natively and it hooks right into Amazon pretty nicely. So that's not a bad one, although uh, you will probably need to get um, some professional help uh, in the UK in terms of uh, a bookkeeper or an accountant or a public uh, accountant of some kind to set the books up, to set up your VAT taxes, to make sure that uh, you know you, you've complied with all of the uh, regulations there. But um, zero is commonly used, uh, so I you know you probably find somebody that uses zero and can work with it. Anyway, uh, back to the bookkeeping here. If you can do these things, if you can get monthly reconciliations, get a correct report from your sales channels, and then have monthly financial statements in front of you, you will know if your business is healthy or not. So let's teach you how to do that. Because Amazon has tons of different reports, and most of them are worthless, but there's there are a couple of reports that are actually quite good. What you'll want to do in Seller Central is go to the reports section and click on payments. Okay. When you do that, then you're going to get a screen that looks like this. And you see statement view, transaction view. This is the payments window. The statement view is what you usually see. It shows you how much money Amazon is holding that they're going to transfer into your bank account you know, in at the next transfer. But most people don't realize that they can come over here and click transaction view to see the details of any particular product that sold recently. So you could scroll through if you want to know how much cash you're actually getting from Amazon on the sale of a product. You can go into the transaction view and see the detail on that. Or you can go over here to date range reports and click on that. And then you want to click generate a report. And what's going to happen when you generate that report is you're going to get something that looks like this. Okay, if you do it right. Now the way to do it right is you do a summary report covering a month. Now you can do a summary report for a year. You can do it for a day. You can do a full transaction report, which um, if you have a big Seller Central account could literally have millions of lines in it. Um, hundreds of thousands of lines. Uh, every product that you've ever sold or that you've sold during a, a, a year or whatever, if you have a big Seller Central account, you know, that's going to be uh, a very big report, but the summary report is very instructive, and so I tend to use the summary reports to do business level decisions. I tend to use the transaction reports when I'm doing product level decisions, okay? Now, here's what that summary report looks like. This is an actual report that we pulled from uh, one of our Seller Central accounts. Uh, I just went and grabbed one. And this one showed income of $135,000 during the month. It was uh, the month of December 2015, actually. I'm not sure why I pulled that one, but it's the one we got. Um, product sales that were non-FBA, that means FBM and so forth, you see that there's a credit right here, and then there's credits over here, all down this right-hand side. That's all the positive numbers coming in. So it's $142,300 of sales. And then down the left-hand side, debits, you see are the, uh, the things that come off of the income. So if you have any refunds, somebody does a return, or if you're doing any promotions like discount codes and things like that, that comes out of here. So that nets out your income at $135,000 for this particular period. Over the right-hand side, we have expenses. And the expenses from Amazon's perspective are things like Selling fees, FBA fees, um, refunds that they credit you back for are a negative expense. Uh, transaction fees, uh, this is what FBA, where FBA charges you to sell the product and, uh, I'm sorry, to fulfill the product, $31,500 for during that month for us, and $19,500 um, was the selling fees, and this is what they charge in, it's a 15% commission to sell the product in the first place, whether you fulfill it or they do. And then there are a few other things, some service fees, and your, there's your $39.99 a month, and then uh, administrative fees and any adjustments. So bottom line is you get your income, you get your expenses, and then you have the transfers going to your bank account. So we happen to have a transfer of $82,015. It was $66,900 in income 
plus um, we also had an Amazon lending we had uh, bought some additional product in Amazon uh, you may not know this but Amazon actually will lend you money once you're a big enough seller it's the top 1% but they'll lend you the money to go uh, buy your product so we grab 15 grand to go out and buy more product with we are continuing to expand our store so these are all the types of things that show up on this summary report and if you hand this report to your bookkeeper or if you are doing your own books if you use this to set up your journal entries for debits and credits on the expenses and on the income and on the transfers then this will give you a good overview in your accounting software now um, Daniel's mentioning that he uses zero and he's in the US and Daniel that's awesome um, I don't particularly like uh, zero much but some people do and that's great you'll have a you'll have to find a, a CPA or a bookkeeper you know eventually that's familiar with zero and uses it in order to continue using zero and and most people in the United States don't use it but there are some you just might have a little harder time finding professionals to help you um, Anna is asking what are the best reports to have pulled to give to a CPA and I'm showing you one of these right now um, but I would not give it to my CPA okay one of the mistakes that we make is that we want to pull reports and take bank statements and things and give it to our CPA and just say you deal with it I gotta tell you uh, I was on a call yesterday with a lady who was doing a million dollars a year on Amazon and netting something like three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and her CPA was charging her two hundred and fifty dollars an hour uh, if he sends an email if he picks up the phone to answer a call if he's doing bookkeeping or ledger or journal entries anything like that uh, tax returns all they were paying six to eight thousand dollars just for a tax return to be filed I mean it's just crazy how expensive that can become and so I would not take reports and hand them to my CPA because the cost is too high what you want to do is take reports and give them to your bookkeeper which is a far more economical way to do it uh, or better yet train your bookkeeper to go get the reports that he or she needs and that's what we do we ha we just have our bookkeeper go get the reports that they need and uh, they do it automatically in the background and I, I don't have to worry about it okay um, I'm getting a very interesting question from Lucas I will take this one uh, he says when I download the CSV file and open it with open office it is all gibberish okay there's a very good reason why that is and I'll just tell you that you have to change it from um, a comma delimited to a tab delimited when you go to open it in open office this is particular to the open office app which is marvelous and I use it all the time if you try and open a CSV file uh, which is a comma separated values file it's a spreadsheet it's a it's a it's a stripped down basic spreadsheet and this is the kind of reports that Amazon likes to give you if you go try and open that uh, you have to change it to you know uh, a, a comma from a comma separated to a tab or from a tab separated to a comma depending on how FBA or Amazon outputs the report then it won't be gibberish anymore also check to make sure that the character set is UTF-8 and that'll all be on the same screen that should solve your your problem okay now this particular report that you're seeing on my screen this was not a comma separated values spreadsheet this was an, uh, a PDF file so you can when you go to download this um, the summary reports come as a PDF that's really nice and you can uh, print it out and take your pencil and write on it and stuff and we do uh, certain things with these and my, my bookkeeper does certain things with these so these are this is a great report but what you do once you have this information and you have your bank statements okay you get your monthly reconciliations and the report from your sales channel that you're going to book for that month all of the income all the expenses all of the activity then you have that booked or you book it yourself either way and then at that point you can generate monthly financial statements now I want to show you what a monthly financial statement looks like this is a P&L profit and loss uh, profit and loss is also known as an income statement either one uh, it's basically a statement that shows you the income and expenses now I can look at a P&L 
and I can look at a balance sheet. Those are the two main reports, the two main financial statements. I can look at those and see the five major areas that they cover and in a matter of mere moments tell you if the business is healthy or not. And you can too. What you want to do is you want to look at these five things. The first one is income and I'm I'm hoping that you can read th this slide here. Um, I will see if I can blow it up. Maybe I can. Yeah, there we go. Income includes uh, positive numbers, sales of product, uh, shipping, income, things like that. So all the income is right here. In this month it was $22,000. Cost of goods sold is not an expense. A lot of people think that the cost of their product is an expense. It's really not. The cost of goods sold is its own separate category of uh, cost. Okay, And so FBA fees and product purchases and shipping and so forth, anything that's associated with a particular and individual product that you sold, any expense associated with that is actually a cost of goods sold and goes above the expenses in this special little category here called cost of goods sold. So income and cost of goods sold are the two things that you look at to result in a gross profit. And in this case, the gross profit was $11,000, about 50% of income. All right? A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that if they sell a product on Amazon and whatever Amazon pays them, that's their profit. No, it's not because you have to subtract the costs of the product too. Then that becomes your gross profit. But behind your gross profit, you also are going to have other expenses. So for example, you're going to have accounting and advertising expenses. You're going to have uh, computer expenses or a virtual assistant or whatever. So these expenses are not specifically tied to a product. They're tied instead to your business. Like, for example, rent. If you're renting a warehouse, it doesn't matter if you sell one product or a million products. The rent is the same. So it, this goes below the line. It's not a cost of goods sold. It's a general expense. So again, you've got income. You've got cost of goods sold that's per, that pertains specifically to the sale of a product. And then you have all your general expenses. That, after you subtract the expenses from the gross profit, you end up with net operating income. This is still not profit. Net operating income is the amount of income that you have to run your business on. And you're going to have taxes and interest. Maybe um, you're going to have uh, depreciation and amortization adjustments. But this is earnings before your taxes, your amortization, your earn, your, uh, your insurance, I'm sorry, your uh, interest expense and before any amortization or depreciation. So we call that EBITDA, E-B-I-D-T-A. Earnings before income taxes, depreciation, amortization, right? This, this is what your operating income is. This is a great number to know. And you might have other income from other things that you do that the business does, maybe um, along the way, other sales channels or whatever. And so you have a net income. Now, if you have a business that has a total income of $22,000, okay? Total sales of $22,000 and nets $8,700 a month. That is excellent. If you were to take this profit and loss statement, this particular one, and go to a bank and say, could you finance me? They would probably be excited to see those kinds of numbers, particularly if you have a history of doing that. Now, uh, this is one of the main reasons why you need to have your company set up as a company and not be commingling your own personal funds is because if you want to get a clean financial statement it needs to only be this business and you reason you want it clean is so that you can get financing or you could sell the business or you could get an accurate picture of what's really happening are you profitable is the business working all right plus if you were running a business that had these kind of numbers wouldn't you want to do more? Wouldn't you want to invest more? Wouldn't you want to grow? I mean, yeah, right? You'd, you'd say, this is working. Let's do more of it. Now, Danielle is asking, how do you get the profit and loss from Amazon? You don't. It doesn't come from Amazon. It comes from QuickBooks. So you want to take your Amazon stuff, like I uh, mentioned before. I'm going to go back up to this previous slide. You're going to take your monthly 
bank statements, PayPal, and everything else, and the reports from your sales channels, and you're going to load those into QuickBooks, and then QuickBooks will generate the monthly financial statements for you. So this plus your bank statements goes in, this comes out of QuickBooks. Okay. Um, Dave is asking, how do you generate a P&L? Well, in QuickBooks, you go to the reports section, and there are all kinds of business reports, and one of them is called an income statement or a profit and loss. And you can do it for a month, you can do it for a year, you can do it for a day, you can do it for any particular period of time uh, that you want to. Okay, um, what does the bookkeeper do with the reports is a question that Anna is asking. Enter into QuickBooks and generate financial reports. Um, she says, just put it into bookkeeping for dummies terms. So yes, that's what, that's what your bookkeeper will do. Your bookkeeper will take the reports and put them into QuickBooks and will take your bank statements and put them into QuickBooks and your PayPal and put them into QuickBooks. Everything goes into QuickBooks, inventory, everything that you do in your business. And then the output from that will be a profit and loss statement like this. And you're going to look at that statement and you're going to read it and you go, wow, I'm making money or wow, I'm losing money or wow, I have huge expenses, but I can cut down some of those expenses or wow, I have excellent income and my expenses are low and I'm really doing well. I want to invest more and do more. So this is what the P&L will help you to, to do. Um, somebody's asking, I created a USA company in March. If I don't use it, until January 2018, do I need a bookkeeper for this year? Uh, yes, because you still have to file a tax return. If you, if you create a company, you, you have to file a tax return. So if you're not going to use it until January, uh, you will need to get a bookkeeper. Now, if you don't really do any business, you may not need a bookkeeper until January to go back and, and, and kind of reconstruct the entire year. But uh, it's better to do it as you go along if you can. But you know, if cash flow is an issue and you don't want to pay a bookkeeper, all the way along, uh, then you know you're going to have to catch it up when the time comes, and that can be, uh, as Will mentioned earlier, that can be a somewhat difficult thing because believe it or not, you forget you forget what you spent money on, you forget what you did, or you know what what's this? You know you're looking through your bank statement from a year ago or your credit card. <laughs> Holy crap, what was that? And you forget. Um, all right, so. Uh, Laura is asking if I need to add funds, her personal money to the business to buy inventory, how do I reflect that on my P&L? And the answer is you don't. You reflect that on a balance sheet and that's the next report. This is the balance sheet and this one happens to be two pages long. I'll show you both pages. There are three areas on a balance sheet that you want to um, pay attention to. Assets right here and I'm going to blow this up again so that you can see it. Assets and they come in various forms like current assets, which are things that are immediate like cash or bonds or uh, stocks or things like that, accounts that you, accounts receivable where people owe you money and so forth, uh, inventory and all that sort of thing. Those are all current assets. And then there are other kinds of assets too, like if you own real estate or that's a fixed asset, um, it's not liquid, so it's not a current asset. There are other kinds of assets, but as a rule, all of your assets go at the top, all of your liabilities go in the middle. And so liabilities and then the third place is equity. So we're going to look at liabilities here and you're going to see whatever the liabilities are is what you owe. Like if you have money that you owe, if you, if you as a person, Laura, put money into the company, then the company owes it to you that you've essentially loaned it to the company. The company is going to owe you that money. So let's say you put $10,000 into the company. You should have a liability right here on the company books for that money. And that's what these two NPs are. Note payable is what that means. It is a, a note or in other words, an IOU or a loan that uh, the company owes back to one of the partners, $4,300 and $7,400 to, to the other partner. That's what those were. And those were subsequently paid off, you know, but as of right now, you can see that that is a current liability. And looking at the next page, you see that there are also some other payables here for like, you know, product or this or that. Um, and so the liabilities total was $13,900. The assets of the business, if you include the bank accounts, and if you include the inventory and everything else, the assets was 30,000. 
So if your assets is 30,000, that's what you paid for your inventory right here. And you can see we have a lot of one product here. Um, and if, if you have $30,000 of assets, bank accounts included, and you have liabilities of, you know, a few loans, a credit card or whatever, you know, that you have in this case, we got 13, nine, that means that you have some equity in your business, right? Well, before you can figure out how much equity, you also have to look at how much money you've taken out of the business. So in this case, there were three partners and each partner had taken out $15,900 as income from the business. So the total draws were 47.7. The retained earnings, that's previous profits that had piled up were 25,000 and the net income was 38,000 so far this year. So that means that even though the business has had in this case, uh, approximately 40,000 plus 25,000, about 64 to $65,000 of total income in this business so far, we've taken out 47.7 of it and we've left in 16,400. So this number here, the liabilities and equity, the 30,031348 is going to match this 30,031348 for the, your assets. Your assets will always match your liabilities and your equity in a business, okay? So on the one hand, uh, it's great to take a look at the assets, and on the other hand, it's great to take a look at the liabilities and how much equity you have, money you've pulled out, or, or income that's still in the bank, things like that. Um, that all tells you a lot about your business. Now, any business that has assets I shouldn't say any business, but for the most part, I mean, if you're looking at a business with $30,000 worth of assets, okay, and that business is generating uh, $38,000 of income, okay, it's generating, if you go back to the income statement, $8,000 a month on $30,000 of, of assets. That is tremendous. You're getting great uh, cash flow through that business. So you're looking at income, you're looking at expenses, you're, and your income includes your cost of goods sold, so income less cost of goods sold, so gross profit. You're looking at expenses, you're looking at your net income, and then over on the balance sheet, you're looking at your assets and you're looking at your liabilities. And you're going to look at those numbers and you're going to determine if the business is healthy or not by understanding how they fit together. And I've just explained how they fit together. You should probably go back and watch this now that you have a better understanding of it. Uh, or maybe you've already got it and you're good to go and we'll go on to the next section. But uh, income, if you have a lot of income, if you have uh, expenses relatively low, that's good. If you have um, a fair amount of assets, but the level of your assets and uh, so forth is low compared with the amount of cash flow that you're generating, 30,000 of assets again, generating 22,000 a month in sales and 8,000, 9,000 dollars a month in net income. That's excellent. If you were to take this set of financials to a bank or to a potential buyer or something else and show it to them, they would be pleased. This is uh, this is good. All right. Um, Olga is asking if Zero or QuickBooks is it an application? Yes, it's a computer program, an app. Um, it's a if you do it online, it's a software as a service. It's a SaaS. Um, but it's basically a program that you use uh, or that your bookkeeper will use. Okay. Um, all right. We, we're getting some other questions. Maybe I'll stop to try and uh, answer those before we move on here to part two. Um, and uh, let's see. Somebody's saying that they're from Colombia in South America. They want to know what the annual fees uh, would be if they wanted to start in FBA prep. Oh, okay. Uh, we'll get to that the cost to have us do bookkeeping and we have book uh, you know bookkeepers and CPAs that we use that are trained to do the, the the books for us and we're certainly making them available to you if you want them they're not that expensive and it will depend on how much work's involved but you know tax returns are in three and four hundred dollars they're not a thousand or six thousand like some people are used to paying and bookkeeping is like 99 bucks a month uh, you know, if it's more complex than that, then there might be some hourly charge on top of that. But it's not all that expensive to get good um, 
bookkeeping. Somebody else, Ivan, is asking, can you work with a local bookkeeper? Does it have to be someone from the U.S.? Okay. If it's a U.S.-based business, you should have a U.S.-based bookkeeper. If it's a, if you're doing a U.K. or a Europe, European business or something, then you should have a European bookkeeper. Um, does the bookkeeper pull records from a business credit card? Uh, the answer, Anna, is yes, but what you actually do is you get a statement uh, from your business credit card every month. You're just going to download the statement and drop it into the Dropbox where our bookkeeper can go get it. And the bookkeeper will do that automatically. So every time you get a credit card statement, you just automatically know that you're going to take a copy, drop it in the Dropbox. Done. He, and the bookkeeper takes care of it from there. Okay, last question. I currently have a sole proprietorship. I want to start a corporation. How do I transfer my goods and funds from myself to my new business? Do I sell my inventory to the business from myself? Do I give my business a loan from myself? How do I set this up in my books? Okay, great questions. I will tell you, Kirsten, that uh, you can loan your company money and the, and the company can then buy your inventory uh, from you. Or you can just loan the company the inventory and set up a, a note to where they're buying the inventory from you over time. Um, your bookkeeper can set that up for you. It's very easy. And I just showed you these note payables here on the balance sheet are an example of having done that. So uh, let's say that you have $10,000 worth of stuff that you're going to loan to the business. You can either capitalize the business, in other words, invest in the business, or you can set it up to where the business needs to repay that money for you. And that's that's a simple thing uh, that you and your bookkeeper can can do. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to forge ahead. I know there are a lot more questions, and we've got, uh, wow, a lot of people on. <laughs> more and more people have come on to this uh, webinar, and, and we sure appreciate your, your time investment, but I also need to move forward. Some people have this down already and are ready to go, so if you still have questions, I will come back around here towards the end and try and pick those up. Okay. All right. Next item to talk about is how to evaluate the product. Remember I started off by telling you that uh, I had evaluated a product and decided to kill it. I'm going to show you my system for evaluating a product and you have to make sure that you include all of the stuff. Oftentimes people think, oh, the only, the only, the only cost I'm going to have is the cost of the product and that's just not true. You're going to have customs and tariffs, okay, if you're importing. You're going to have inbound shipping especially if you're importing, but even if you're buying from a factory, they're going to ship it to you. Uh, you're going to have packaging cost and preparation cost. That's labeling, bagging, tagging, all those kind of things, uh, photos. Uh, you're going to have costs associated with uh, preparing the package uh, at the factory or preparing the, fac the package yourself or at the warehouse uh, to prepare it for FBA. Um, you're going to have outbound shipping which means you're shipping it to FBA or you're shipping it to a client if you're uh, self-fulfilling uh, on that. You're going to have marketing and advertising. Marketing is not advertising. Marketing is the cost or the, uh, the discipline of setting up a plan for how to advertise. And advertising is the implementation in various channels. So you might advertise using pay-per-click. You might advertise using billboards. You might advertise using magazines or radio or TV or other popular media. You might advertise using any number of channels, but it's all part of your overall marketing plan. Your messaging, your positioning in the market, how you portray it, that's all marketing. So those two things you have to account for as well. And then, of course, in the sales channel that you're using, whether it's eBay, whether it's uh, Shopify, you're going to have costs, especially uh, you know Amazon. They charge that 15% commission, and then they also have fulfillment costs and other costs like you saw back here on this particular thing. Uh, all of these FBA selling fees, that's a sales channel cost. Seller fulfilled selling fees are sales channel costs. The transaction fees are fulfillment costs. And so these all need to be accounted for. Um, and then what you want to end up with is the bottom line contribution. What does each of your products contribute to your company? Now, you know, products are not like spouses, okay? Don't marry your products. This is one of the first things that's hard to learn as an entrepreneur, as a seller online. Don't marry your products. You need to be willing to fire them. They're not your children, okay? They're not your best friend. Your products are there to do a job, and the job is to contribute to the bottom line of the company, and if they're not doing that, then you either need to have a plan for how they're going to do that or you need to get rid of them and move on. 
So I'm going to show you how to figure out what the contribution is. So all you need to do is create a spreadsheet and this is my actual spreadsheet and these are actual products. I've replaced the names and the URLs but I'm going to show you. You just stick the SKU, the product title, the category and I'll blow this up so it's easier for you guys to see. The category, the URL for Amazon or eBay or whatever it is so that you can go look at the listing. You put in your retail price and then you put in any other metrics that you're tracking. I like to track the sales per month. Uh, I use several tools to, to predict, in other words, to estimate what my sales per month should be. And then I come around later and I put actual sales per month in after I've launched the product. But if, I'm, if I haven't launched the product yet and I'm evaluating to determine if I'm interested in selling it, then I put the averages in here that I can get from the tools that I use. Ace Inspector Pro is a great tool. Um, I say that as one of the owners of the company that, that, that you know, created Ace Inspector. Uh, but it is an excellent tool. It's not expensive to use and it gives you all kinds of great information including estimated sales figures and income and things like that. So I would of course uh, recommend that you look at Ace Inspector um, Pro uh, if you are interested in you know, trying to, to keep track of as much data as you can and really do a tight, a good analysis on products. Uh, you can also keep track of BSR, bestseller ranking, right, on Amazon, reviews, ratings, variations, and things like that. So this, this part up here, the product analysis part, is uh, just the basics. The real analysis happens down here, and I'm going to pan this back out so you can see all of it. Again, um, unit price all the way to annual contribution, these are the numbers that matter, okay? I'm going to blow this up and show you what each of these numbers is. Hopefully you will be able to follow. But I currently have three products and please note that you see there's three products here. So this part of the spreadsheet is really just a continuation of this part. It keeps going to the right. Okay, I cut it in two pieces so it fit on my screen better to show you but it's one line for each product and that line is goes all the way across um, this part and all the way across this part. Um, that means that if you were to take this particular part and tack it onto the end right here, it would it would look like it does on my screen. Okay, so here we are. I'm I want to know the unit price. This is what it costs me. FOB. FOB means freight on board. It means that's the cost that uh, of the product delivered to the nearest port to the manufacturer. Okay. And from there, I've got to pay for inbound shipping. So there's an inbound ship. And that, of course, needs to include estimated tariffs. Do not forget to, to do your tariffs. We've had one customer of ours recently who didn't know that there was going to be tariffs and were shocked when um, the tariffs were there, when, when she got a bill for them, you know. <laughs> Oops. So, you know, make sure that you uh, calculate your tariffs. If you don't know how, get a customs broker to help you. So inbound shipping needs to include all the costs of getting it to your door. That could be planes, trains, automobiles, could be ships, satellites, I don't know, um, <laughs> drones. Well, however you get the thing delivered to your door, whatever the cost is, including everything, that's what you want to put in here per unit. So this particular product is $15.50. It cost me $0.95 cents to get it into my hand, okay? It cost me $0.75 cents to ship to FBA. Therefore, my cost of goods sold is $17.20. Yes, this cost of goods sold is the same cost of goods sold that we saw right here when it says cost of goods sold right here. Okay, um, that's the product pit purchases shipping to Amazon, and then I'm going to have shipping to customers and and FBA fees on top of that. Okay, so back to the spreadsheet. The net from Amazon is how much money I put in my pocket when I sell one. So $79 retail, Amazon takes their fees, okay, and I put $64.59 into my pocket. Well, how did I get that number? I put all of these numbers in, and I calculate a gross margin. I calculate a cost of goods sold as a basis. Now, what this means is of the retail price on this particular product of $79, my cost of goods sold for just the product and shipping to get it to me is 21.77% of the retail price. That's excellent. 
you want this number to be below 35% if you can. Certainly below 50. Total Amazon fees, this is what they charge, and as a percentage of retail, that's what the fees are on this product. Okay. And, and that's Amazon fees plus FBA fulfillment fees. So that's how I get my net from Amazon is I take the retail price minus the Amazon fees. That gets me my net from Amazon. And then I subtract the cost of goods sold and I end up with my net margin. Now margin is not profit. Again, people sometimes think that net margin is profit and it's really not because again, looking at your profit and loss statement, your net operating income is not necessarily the number that you're looking at. Your gross profit here and then you have other things coming down into your net income and then finally your net income down here as profit is at the very bottom. So you have to factor in all of these other things before you can call it profit. So don't make the mistake of thinking that after you get your money from Amazon and you've paid for the product that, that everything that you still have in your hand is profit. It's not. Now, I also calculate 90 days worth of inventory and what the cost will be for that 90 days worth of inventory. And I calculate a 20% ad spend. And the reason this number is in blue is I might make this higher, I might make this lower, but my 20% ad spend, this is my advertising budget. I'm budgeting $15.80 a unit to sell this product. That's excellent. There's plenty of room in this product to be able to do that because after that's all done, after I've paid for my ads, after I've paid for my inventory, after I've paid for Amazon, I've paid for everything, I have a net profit before uh, my normal business expenses, the net profit of $31.59. So, uh, $79 retail, a net profit of $31.59 on this. That's excellent. And what it also means, if I'm gonna sell 521 units every 90 days, I'm going to have projected revenue of 165,000 bucks a year, um, and I'm going to have an, a contribution of $65,000 to my company. That's how much money that product is going to hand my company over a year. And out of that annual contribution, I've got to pay, you know, uh, rent and overhead and employees. Pay myself, of course. Got to have some money come my way, otherwise it's not worth doing. Um, got to pay for um, things like insurance and automobile and travel and, and everything else. So that comes out of this number. But if I'm evaluating a product and I see the annual, annual contribution is much larger than the value of the inventory, then that is a great thing. It's m more money coming back to me than what I initially put in. I put in 41,000. I got back the 41,000 plus 65 more is $106,000, back in my pocket on a $41,000 retail uh, uh, investment. So this is uh, the kind of numbers that I like. And we can also look at other products and you can see these are real numbers from real products. Uh, the cost of goods sold is there. This is in yellow because it's above 35 but less than. Uh, I'm sorry, it's above 25, but less than 35. So they're still good. They're just not quite as good as the green numbers. My net margins are excellent. I'm always shooting for a net margin of at least $10. I want to put $10 in my pocket every time I sell a unit on Amazon if I can. And I want my net margins to be big, at least 35%. And I want, uh, at the end of the day, the annual contribution to be more than a, a small amount. Now, you might recall I told you about these stuffed animal toy thing that would explode in my garage and, and ended up costing me a lot more money. Well, it's because the Amazon fees here, the FBA fees were like four times or five times what I was expecting. The shipping costs to FBA were two or three times what I was expecting. The inbound shipping was more. The customs and tariffs were more. And at the end of the day, the contribution ended up being less than $10,000 on a $100,000 uh, retail value. So you can see we were way out of balance and that's why we killed that product. When you see the numbers in front of you, you, you then know what you should do. Don't fly by the seat of your pants. Don't do it based on your gut instinct or whether you think it's a pretty product or you're married to it and you love it and you're going to beat it to death. Uh, don't do that. Look at the numbers. Figure out what your numbers are. 
figure out what your net margin is, figure out what your net margin is as, a, as dollars and as a percent, figure out what your cost of goods is, okay? And if you can do those things and then have a budget for marketing and advertising and so forth, uh, then you should be able to calculate a net profit and from there you should be able to figure out if the product is worth doing or if the product is worth keeping. Okay, um, I'm going to circle back around and pick up some questions, but while I do that, I want you guys to look at this. This is a graph. Everything I just told you, I'm trying to put into a picture form so you can see what a typical product, and this is our average product, a breakdown of the proceeds. Our average product sale price is $41.12, okay? And the cost of goods sold for our average product is $13.76. You can see that number up here. The marketing is 20% of that 41.12, so that's $8.22. Amazon takes their slice at $6.17. The fulfillment cost is $3.74 on average, and the profit is $9.23, or 23.2% of the $41.12 uh, sale price. So you can see that the cost of goods and the marketing and Amazon and fulfillment and so forth is all kind of factored in and you have a nice big slice of profit here. What you can also see is if you spend less on marketing you get more in profit. Every dollar you do not spend on marketing goes to the bottom line of your profit. So this is your incentive to try and optimize your marketing to try and make those dollars really meaningful and not overspend on marketing because every dollar you don't spend here goes right there. All right, let's let's take some questions while you're while you're looking at that. Somebody's asking, how do you establish credit as a new business? Okay, that's kind of off topic, Jason. But uh, uh, the bottom line is that you start off by getting small accounts with vendors, and then pretty soon you can get a done done in Bradstreet number. It's like a credit report for your business. You can apply for it and get a credit report through Dun and Bradstreet. And then once you have a DNB number, then um, you can obtain terms often with um, different creditors or with different suppliers and you can go to your bank with your balance sheet and your income statement and say hey this is my business would you be willing to give it a loan if you have clean books and you have excellent numbers the bank or credit union or your uncle or whatever might consider it um, yeah, and it's it's worth saying too, Reed. You know, if you have clean books, you're gonna get better deals um, if you're trying to sell your company and the books are a mess well, a potential buyer is going to look at that and discount the value of your business. Even though the business may be worth more than the books um, indicate, um, just the uncertainty and the, the risk of that is going to cause people to value your business lower. So, I mean, having clean books is an absolute must. And, uh, and this is absolutely incredible stuff, guys. I do not know this for my products, so this is awesome to see. This uh, proceeds from the average product, that is incredible. And I just want to point out too that Reed is doing this with Excel, guys. What do we say all the time? You know, there's all these tools out there every day. There's new tools for Amazon sellers. You got to avoid most of them. Um, you know, I, I always say most of the tools out there are just glorified spreadsheets, anyways. Um, I, I just love to see that Reed is doing this through Excel and, and not some fancy tool uh, because you don't need the fancy tools to get this kind of important information. Yeah, just jump onto Google, uh, you know, open a Google spreadsheet and go. And if you don't know how to build a simple uh, spreadsheet with these calculations, it, you know, there are very easy YouTube videos that will teach you how. And you can take this, you know, uh, pause the video, write down these categories, uh, write down the type of information that goes in there, and, and you can use this as a model too. Um, or you can, you know, generate your own, develop your own if you're more advanced. But these kinds of things can be done on Google, can be done on Excel, can be done in open office. You don't need to go out and pay a bunch of money to uh, have a, a tool. That's absolutely right, Will. And uh, let's get back to these questions. I know there's a lot. Yeah, maybe we'll. I'll, I'll try and blow through a few questions. Then I got to get to part three, which is really, really the thing that changed my business the most. Um, I mean. Uh, yeah, you'll see in a minute. Uh, so Dave is asking, why do we need a bookkeeper every month? Can't we just do it, you know, once a year? Well, you can, sure, but here's the problem. If you do it once a year, 
then you don't get a nice monthly balance sheet like this. You don't get a nice monthly P&L. You don't know if your business is growing or shrinking. You don't know if your profitability is going up or down through the year. And so when it comes time in uh, September, you know, <laughs> do I pull the trigger on the Christmas inventory or not? Am I going to spend that $100,000 or not? Am I, you know, when you start getting, you know, several months away or a year away from your last good solid financial statement, you're flying by the seat of your pants. And that is, Dave, exactly what you should not do. You need to have good financials. You need to have them regularly. I would not do it less than monthly, although I know some people that do it only quarterly. But man, quarterly is just not often enough for me. I need to know what's going on in my business. I mean, this is my livelihood. This is what pays my bills. And it's important for me to understand what's happening in the business month by month. Some people do it week by week, uh, you know, as often as you can do it. Um, somebody's saying, what information do you not give the bookkeeper? Ah, great question. Um, what information do you not give the bookkeeper? Well, I wouldn't give them my um, access to my bank account to where you could spend my money. Uh, I don't let them adjust my pricing in my Amazon store. But see, when we set our bookkeeper up to be able to uh, have user level access into our Amazon store, we set the level of permissions in every area. So I give my bookkeeper access to the reports, but not access to be able to actually do anything inside of Amazon other than pull reports and stuff. So really the type of information that you do not give the bookkeeper um, is uh, sensitive personal stuff that uh, would give the bookkeeper the ability to go spend your money, for example. But really, uh, you know, if you get a good reputable bookkeeper, um, you shouldn't really have to worry too much about that because um, it's yeah. their livelihood too. And, and you know, I mean, there's, there's a, a well-known thing with accountants and bookkeepers, especially accountants. Um, you're, mo most accountants know more about people than they may even know about themselves. So I mean, there. You know, for me, I pretty much give them all transactions and um, let them piece it together. <laughs> yep, yep. Somebody's asking if I use any plugins for QuickBooks Online. Uh, Michael, I don't even use QuickBooks Online anymore. I just, I found it to be much more difficult to use. But when I was using it, I did not use any plugins. Um, would you suggest that we have everything set up in FBA prep before my product research and knowing what is the demand in the market? Is it too soon to set everything up before having, before being clear about what's going to be your business? Um, doing research for your product is the first step. What do you think based on your experience? Well, yes, you want to do the research on your product first, but that should not take you very long. Once you've got two or three products picked out, and especially if you've done the research and done the analysis kind of like this, you you know what you're looking at. As soon as you're spending money and you're buying product, that's when you need to make sure that you get your business set up correctly and that you get your bookkeeping in place to track all of these expenses. You probably set up your business this month and start your bookkeeping within 30 to 60 days after that. All right, um, let's see other questions. Um, how do we get access to the spreadsheet? Ah, I see what you're asking, Daniel. You're saying, hey, I don't want to go build this myself. I just want to take yours and just use it as a model and do it that way. And maybe if I was a really nice guy, I would do that. Do you think I should do that, Will? Should I give people access to this particular spreadsheet? I mean, it's a pretty awesome spreadsheet. I know these guys would love it. Um, it could be, you know, I think a lot of the people on here are uh, e-commerce umpire members. This could be a great thing to, you know, give away for free to e-commerce umpire members and maybe make it, you know, some type of lead magnet or something for, for non-members. Because, yeah, I think, you know, this is something that a lot of people are going to want. So we should certainly, if you're, if you're open to sharing it, uh, I think we could definitely generate some interest in this. Well, look, I appreciate the time and effort that people are putting into sitting here and staying here with us. The number of attendance has gone up. The number of people that are engaged in this continues to go up. It's obviously, uh, it's worthwhile. So I will... I will make this available, Will, to you, and you can make it available to the people in your organization that you uh, feel like would benefit from it, and uh, we'll take care of that after this webinar. No problem at all. Okay, so there's all your right, answer, great. Daniel. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of you, buddy. No problem. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I'll, I'll make sure to uh, message you about that after this read. Appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Um, 
David wants to know, is it easy to find or work out on Amazon before you launch a new product, all of Amazon's expenses? And the answer is yes. What you do, this is remarkably simple. In fact, I might even be able to show you how to do it. But you just go search on uh, Google for FBA calculator. And um, FBA calculator is, let's see if I can show you here the results from my search here. Okay, so I did a quick Google search, and there's FBA Revenue Calculator. I just type in F FBA Calculator, and there it is, FBA Revenue Calculator. Here's your FBA Revenue Calculator, and all you have to do is put in an ASIN. So I'm going to go and uh, just find a random ASIN on Amazon, and I will show you exactly how to get this information. Now, of course, Ace Inspector Pro will um, give you this information automatically, but um, I don't know. Let's type in... Um, I don't know, tent pegs. All right, tent pegs right here. Um, I'm going to go here to the tent pegs. And I'm going to grab this B00 number. This happens to be the ASIN, or in other words, the Amazon Standard Identification Number right there. And I'm going to search for that inside the calculator. And it found the product, OK? And I happen to know that the price of this product is $8.76, and using Amazon's fulfillment, $8.76 would be the price. And if I'm going to ship it to Amazon, I'm going to just assume for a minute that it's going to cost me like $0.50 cents to ship that product to Amazon. That might be high, but, you know, hey, I'm just going to put a number in there. And if I click Calculate, look what happens. Fulfillment by Amazon fees are going to be $4.19. The selling fee is $1.31. That means I'm going to get $2.76 of proceeds every time I sell one of these, okay? My net profit, it's calling it net profit of $2.76, but that's because I haven't put any cost of product in here. What if my product cost is $2? Okay, now I'm going to recalculate this, and now I see that my net profit is $0.76, cents and my margin is only 8.68%. 8 this is a bust. I would not sell this product if my cost was two dollars and if my shipping was fifty cents to Amazon and when I say cost of product by the way you need to include not just the cost of the product itself but the shipping the tariffs all that other stuff that uh, that we looked at before all of these things inbound shipping shipping to FBA and then of course it calculated the Amazon fees for you so I have just shown you um, how to figure out on Amazon what those fees are. If you sign up for Ace Inspector Pro or get another tool like that, then you can see that stuff automatically. Uh, and so you don't have to spend your time looking it up, looking it up, looking it up, and doing all those estimate estimates. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Kevin says, you're the man, Reed. Well, I, how can I just not, you know, throw that in there? <laughs> Uh, it was not a question, but I, I sure appreciate your your willingness to stick through this stuff. You know, bookkeeping can be boring, guys. Let's face it. It's not the most exciting uh, webinar ever in the world. But this stuff, business, business itself is exciting. And so if this is part of business, then you just got to buckle down and do it. And even if you don't love it, you still got to do it. This is, like you said, too, I mean, this is the easy stuff to ignore that I have personally been bit very hard by. So, um, you know, when you, when you start making money and you have money going in and out of your business, it's just absolutely essential that you get this stuff set up quick because the longer you wait, the more expensive it's going to be and the tougher it's going to be and the longer it's going to take. Uh, it, it's another thing, just like Reed's session last week uh, with business structures. Uh, it's the type of thing you set it up once, and it, it it there's very little maintenance with this, um, especially if you get a reliable bookkeeper and accountant. Very little maintenance and and a lot of upside, and it's something that you just have to do as a business owner. Not only can you make better business decisions, um, but it's also just required for taxes and things like that as well. Yeah, and uh, David uh, is asking an interesting question. He says, "What about a product not yet on Amazon?" Well, uh, look, I know that will has a lot of great instructional videos and other things on how to sell on Amazon, how to evaluate products, how to find that information. So, Will, I don't want to step on your toes, but I will answer this one, David, and I'll give you a little secret. If the product that you want to sell is not yet on Amazon, 
that's fine. Go on to Amazon and find one just like it. Same size and weight, same relative um, you know, type of product, same category or whatever. And use that one as your target to, to find out what your expenses will be. Okay? So just go find a competitor, price out the competitor, and that'll get you where you need to be. All right. <clears throat> Let's move on. The the next section, the last section here of our um, of our webinar about bookkeeping and making business decisions is how to build a 90-day cash flow chart. Now, for those of you that have never built a 90-day cash flow chart, which I'm pretty sure will be almost every one of you on this webinar, I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. What you need to have handy is your current bank balances, a list of your planned expenditures, and some idea of what you estimate your income to be over the next 90 days. And all you do is, I do this in Google Drive because I share this with my partners. Here is a sample 90-day cash plan. You'll see August here is in yellow. Everything above yellow is, this yellow line here was August. Everything above this yellow line was September, and everything above this yellow line is October. Oops. What, uh, what I need to do here is just, there we go, make that go away, is show you what goes in. On the left-hand side, I put the date, the dollar amount, and the description of the obligations that I have. So if we were in July, or if we're sitting here on the first day of August, let's say, and I want to do my cash plan for August, September, and October, 90 days out. I know, for example, that I've got a $3,500 product purchase for product number two, and I've got a vendor payment that's due on the 6th, and I've got a product purchase that's due on the 15th, and then I'm going to have to pay ocean freight and tariffs and stuff to my customs people on the 25th, and I have an approximate or I have an exact amount. I know that in August I got $12,417 worth of planned expenditures. And guys, you could put in salaries, virtual assistants, you can put in um, you know, your insurance payment, your rent for your building, whatever your planned expenditures are, make this as big as you want. And then over on the right-hand side, I put my planned income. So balance forward is the money in my bank account or accounts. And then my estimated income that I think I'm going to get from FBA or from Amazon or from you know, Shopify or from eBay or Jet or Walmart or wherever you're selling. You can put the estimated income and the dates that you think that's going to come in and put that over here on the right hand side. And so this just tells me here's what I'm expecting moving forward in terms of expenses and here's what I'm expecting in terms of income. If I look at this, August, I'm gonna have $12,400 worth of expenditures. I'm at $43,402 in cash, cash in the bank and estimated income together. That means I'm gonna have 30,985 to the good. That's how much money I have to play with. I can pay myself, which you should do out of this, and you can allocate some portion of that to buying more products, which will result, of course, down here in September and in October, will result in additional product purchases. So if you see this number, you've got a good healthy number here for August, then you might decide it's time to go expand. I want to buy more products. I want to, I want to kick this thing in the butt and get going, right? So you do the same thing for September. Uh, my planned purchases for September is uh, maybe this, the product purchase number four. I've got some ocean freight due on product two that I've just bought right there. I might have a deposit to pay. I might have a, a balance payment due to a factory. I might need to pay um, my uh, CPA for completing my taxes. You know, Whatever the planned expenditures are, everything you're aware of, everything you know about that's going to hit, try and estimate the day and the amount. And you can see September is a good month too. We're going to have 21000 left over in September. And in October, I don't have any planned expenditures on this chart. And I still have some income that I'm ex expecting from my Amazon store. So I got $28,000 to play with there. That gives me overall $20,000 worth of forward obligations, $100,000 of income. That gives me $80,000 of discretionary money. How much am I going to pay myself? Oh, I'm going to figure that out. Maybe I pay myself twenty grand. 30 grand, 50 grand, some number. And then how much am I going to allocate to running the business, um, unexpected expenditures, expenditures or growth? This, believe it or not, I know it looks horribly simple and archaic. 
but guess what? This is probably the most powerful tool that I use in my business right here. I want to know what I have in my hand in terms of cash and what do I need to have in my hand moving forward and how much am I expecting to get and lay it out month by month so that I kind of know if I need to borrow money or if I'm going to have uh, an excess of cash. Okay, This is how I do it. It's very simple. I don't use a bookkeeper for this, but a bookkeeper certainly can do this. Actually, I shouldn't say I don't use a bookkeeper for this. Uh, just total truth here, uh, my company's big enough that we have a, a CFO, and our CFO does this. So it's not a bookkeeper. <laughs> it's, a, it's a person that we pay to, to do this type of uh, forward looking. But point is, I used to do this by hand myself, and it doesn't take very long but it really gives me insight and as I pay something like let's say I paid for this product my balance in the bank goes down and I delete this off of the spreadsheet so it's gone and my bank balance is adjusted that one's gone and then by when the sixth rolls around I delete this one and I adjust my bank balance and when the fifteenth rolls around I delete this one and I adjust my bank balance so that during the month I see the progress if that makes sense Okay. All right, <clears throat> this is my 90 day cash flow chart. And I know it's simple. I know it seems easy, but this will help you make really good forward thinking decisions. And frankly, if you go back and look at our original questions right here, how do I know if my business is healthy? Well, how you know that is by looking at current financial statements. How do I know if my product is profitable? You know that by looking at a current product analysis spreadsheet. How do I forecast future cash needs? You do that by looking at your 90 day chart. Now, if you happen to have those things done for you, okay, your financial statements, your profitability um, per product, and your future cash needs, if you have outsourced all of that, then what running your business consists of is glancing at those reports, okay? Glancing at your P&L saying, yeah, that looks good. Glancing at your balance sheet saying, yeah, that looks good. Glancing at your product numbers and saying, wow, that's looking really good. And glancing at this saying, yeah, the new products I'm considering are, you know, very similar numbers to this, so those are good ones. Glancing at your 90-day cash plan so that you know what you got to do in the future. And then... Um, start making business decisions because you know everything you need to know financially about your business at that point. How much money do you have in the future? How much money do you have right now? Uh, what products are working? Which products should you invest in? Which ones should you kill? Which ones, uh, you know, and, and new products if you want to grow, if you have money to grow. How much money? How many products? And start um, allocating those funds and start preparing to spend that money because you know it's going to come in as you sell and as you realize and uh, you know get your hands on this thirty thousand dollars you're going to be ready to uh, to pay for the product so now's the time to research the product and in 10 20 30 days after you've got the samples and you've decided to move forward with it and the numbers look good you know you're gonna have the money to make that investment all right back to our main questions the fourth is what part of this should I outsource now I'll just tell you me I outsource number one all the financials the bookkeeping all that I outsource the product profitability I do not outsource I do that myself in terms of the spreadsheet but I outsource most of the numbers on the spreadsheet I hire somebody either a virtual assistant or uh, an employee or a whatever a business partner whoever to conduct the research to go to the factories get the quotes so that I can fill in good numbers find out how much shipping is see the unit price the inbound shipping to, to check with FBA to find out what the Amazon fees are all this stuff can be done by a virtual assistant after you've identified a product in a factory that you're particularly interested in buying or in, in, in selling I should say you're gonna buy it from them but you're gonna sell it so once you've identified a product idea and you want to go ahead and sell it, then at that point uh, you start looking around for potential manufacturers and suppliers. And once you have that, then whoever's whoever you want to have do that, whether it's yourself or whether it's somebody else, can reach out to them 
get the pricing, negotiate the deal, uh, get all the numbers put together and put into your spreadsheet for you. And some of these will auto calculate. You only really need to put in the Amazon information, the inbound shipping and FBA shipping, the unit price, and the amount you're going to spend on, on ads. That's really all that you have to put in here in order to have all the rest of this populate for you and show you if it's a good idea to, to move forward on that product or not. So I don't outsource that analysis, but I outsource parts of it so that the information is fed to me and then I take that information and put it in the spreadsheet or I teach my virtual assistant where on the spreadsheet to input the information. And by the way, our spreadsheet is typically at least 500 products long. Products we're currently selling, products we're currently evaluating, and products that we're going to be evaluating as soon as we get enough time to, to move forward and enough money that we're ready to expand again. I try and keep at least 500 product ideas going in this product analysis spreadsheet, just so you know. And, it, and guys, it's not hard to come up with 500 product ideas. I know it sounds like a ton. We coach people all the time and, and, and show them how they come up with 500 product ideas. You can do it in, in, uh, in less than one day. So it's, it can be done, and you ought to do that part yourself. The product ideas are, uh, are really the, the, the starting point for everything in your business, and you ought to be doing that. You ought to be coming up with new product ideas all the time and then evaluating them. Finally, how do I forecast future cash needs? This, you know, in my current business, my CFO puts all this stuff on here, but this is easy. This is something you can do yourself. You don't need to outsource this. Um, you can but I wouldn't. Uh, when you're first starting out, I would outsource the financial statements and I would do my own product analysis and I would forecast my own future cash. That's what I would do if I was starting out. As your business grows and as you get more capability, you're having more products to keep track of and you're expanding, you will teach other people how to do those things. Now, uh, number one question, where should I outsource, particularly the bookkeeping and the financial statements and so forth? Well, I have an idea for you. Why don't you reach out to Ayana at fbaprep.com. Just send her an email and say, I am interested in your bookkeeping package because we have our bookkeeping staff uh, standing by, ready, willing, and able to set up your books for you to uh, take care of all of the uh, detail work on all that and to provide you with those financial statements every month and it's not expensive. For most Amazon businesses, it's 99 bucks a month or less. Sometimes it's less, especially if you do an annual plan. Um, some people that are doing a million dollars a year, uh, all they need is simple bookkeeping on an annual plan. And uh, so, you know, if you're just starting out, maybe you do it yourself for a few months until you have the cash flow to be able to justify paying a bookkeeper, but you really don't want to wait too long. Don't wait until your business is doing 10,000 a month. You know, once your business is doing two or 3,000 in sales a month, um, you know, you ought to be start looking for a bookkeeper. And the reason is because you gotta make good decisions in order to get to 10,000 a month, and then 100,000 a month, and then a million a month, okay? You've gotta have that information to get there, it's necessary information. It's not, you know, superfluous. It's stuff that you really, really need. So uh, I would recommend contacting Ayana at FBA Prep. She can set up a consultation with uh, me or with our bookkeeper to um, talk about what your circumstances are and if our bookkeeping package would be a good fit for you. If it's not a good fit for you, that's fine. Uh, we can give you a recommendation on what might be a good fit, you can go out and find that. If it is a good fit for you, I don't think you're gonna get a better price and I don't think you're gonna get more competent and better overall bookkeeping um, personnel uh, who are trained already on Amazon. They already know how to pull the reports, where to pull the reports, what to do and how to do it, how to handle everything from inventory uh, adjustments to year-end capital inflows and outflows and all of the things that, that you do during the year, including money you lend to the business and how to book it correctly. All that stuff, they've been doing it for decades. And uh, so I think that uh, if you at all don't like doing the detail work on this, you might want to just reach out to Ayana and let's talk about it and see if it's a fit. If you love doing the details yourself, 
if you're good at it, if you have an accounting background or whatever, you can set up your own books in QuickBooks and you can keep your own books for a while, but eventually you're not going to want to do that part anymore because it sucks a lot of your time. Look, as a business owner, you want to offload as many hats as you can. If a hat is a responsibility or something that has to happen in your business, you want to offload as many of those things as you can so that your job description is making decisions, not doing busy work like entering transactions or building spreadsheets. Okay, You want to take the information that you get from the financial statements and the spreadsheets and the transactions that have been entered. You want to take the output of that and use it to make decisions because ultimately the business decisions you make are yours and the quality of those decisions depends on the quality of the information you gather. I don't know if you've heard the term garbage in, garbage out, guy go, but if you put garbage in, you're going to get garbage out in terms of decision making. And garbage is what most people's books are. I mean, let's face it. So um, I'm, I'm pleading with you, I'm begging you, please don't overlook this very, very important part of your business because ultimately you need to make good decisions and if you're going to make good decisions, you need good input information. And, and I've just shown you how to do that and I've just shown you, you know, the easy way to get it done. So um, let's hit back to the questions. Let's see, Daniel's asking, um, does it make sense to keep my original seller's account under 20000 and then open up an S corporation and start a new seller's account? Well, you know, that's a business decision. I just talked uh, all about for the last while about how to make good business decisions, how to take all that information in and, and do it. So the real issue is what will your tax profile look like? Um, how will you transition into the S corporation? But frankly, uh, I would open up an S corporation long before I got to 20,000 in sales. I would probably want to do that sooner than that. And um, uh, if you have questions about S corps or when is an ideal time to open that up, then you can also re out, reach out to Ayana at fbaprep.com. It's A-Y-A-N-A. -A -A, and she can set up an appointment with you for a free consultation with the lawyer that we have on staff who sets those up and talk about what it takes to transition and uh, so forth. And that, that consultation is free. I mean, you might as well take advantage of it. All right. Um, Will, I know you've been yes. answering questions away in the background. What other questions do people have um, that we can uh, go ahead and attack right now? I think you have gotten a lot of them, and I have not been marking them all as you get them, but um, I do have a, a few here that we can ask. Guys, if you have um, any additional questions, any questions that, we, that you have asked that we haven't um, answered yet, feel free to copy and paste those back in the question box or um, ask your question. Uh, I'm sure I think Reed probably has at least uh, another 15 minutes or so uh, that he can hang out and answer questions. So. Uh, keep the questions coming, guys. For a current question, let me go through here. Yeah, and if, if you see any questions as well, Reed, um, I don't have any ready to go. Okay, no problem at all. Uh, one of the questions that uh, I hear a lot is, you know, when, when I go to set up my bookkeeping, how do I know if my bookkeeper is good? How do I get a good one? How do I get a good CPA instead of a, you know, typical... And what's the level of the standard in terms of uh, service? You know, what should I expect? So let me uh, just speak to that for just a minute. Um, a good bookkeeper is one who will understand what you're asking and what the output needs to be and will help you by asking you for information. They're not bothering you when they ask you, you know, what was this expenditure for? What was that expenditure for? What they're really trying to do is get the information they need to be able to give you what you're looking for in terms of accurate financials. And so you want to have a good working relationship with your bookkeeper. And, um, you know, our bookkeepers that we use do that. Uh, they'll give me homework. <laughs> like once a month, uh, I, I get a homework assignment. To, These 12 transactions, tell me what they were. And so I just shoot an email back and, and say, well, this one was this and that one was that. And we bought product here and this one was a travel expense and that was, uh, you know, a cell phone bill, you know, whatever it was. 
And over time, the bookkeeper will see these transactions come up again and again and will stop asking you about them because they already know what they are because they booked it last time. So as you build a relationship with your bookkeeper, it gets better and better and better to the point where you know, it's almost like autopilot. That's what you're looking for. And so um, one who asks you a lot of questions and, and uh, is willing to take the time to try and get the answers out of you up front is usually going to be a good bet for a bookkeeper. For a CPA, what you're looking for is somebody who doesn't mind if you pick up the phone and ask a question and doesn't bill you $250 an hour for answering a question or sending you an email. And you want one that's reasonably priced but has plenty of deep experience in dealing with the IRS and in dealing with all different forms of tax returns and mostly dealing with the planning that you should be doing. Um, we didn't really talk much about long-term planning, but that's something that your CPA can help you with. And we use a team of excellent CPAs uh, who are very, very good at those kinds of things, and we can certainly give you a referral on that too. So um, that's what you should expect. That's what you should look for when it comes to hiring financial professionals. Um, all right, other questions? Yeah. Uh, sometimes just to, just to piggyback on that too, Reed, you know, don't be intimidated to talk to a CPA or an accountant either. Um, you know, I, as most of you know, I got started in business at a very young age. So up until, you know, five, six years in business, I didn't have an accountant or a CPA. And I was trying to do all of this myself. Um, I, I was just very intimidated to go talk to, um, you know, a CPA as a, as a teenage entrepreneur. Um, so I spent my time in accounting books and tax books and estate planning and so many different things trying to understand the U.S. tax code and how it works. Um, and the truth of the matter is that's, that was not the best strategy. Um, once I actually got in touch with the CPA accountant and depended on them, uh, what, what you start to discover is that CPAs and accountants are actually uh, pretty um, interested in your businesses. Um, they're pretty interested as you, in you guys as entrepreneurs. So it's not like they're these huge authority figures that are just super intimidating and they're going to make fun of you when you don't know certain things. Um, I go to my CPA all the time and I say, listen, uh, I have no idea what I'm talking about, so you tell me, but here's something I heard about that I thought we could do or um, just anything like that. But the things that I thought I knew when I finally did go in and get a CPA and accountant reconciled all my books, all these things that I learned from books and blog posts that I thought I knew, uh, most of them ended up being incorrect anyways. And um, and my CPA had you know much better um, uh, kind of yeah. tax minimization strategies anyways. So don't be intimidated. Get in touch with them and um, and use them as an advisor, as almost a coach, um, because. That's really what they're there for. They don't call themselves coaches, but like Reed said, uh, when you're looking for a CPA, you want someone that you can depend on as a coach when you have questions about these subjects. So, And, you know, people get into weird situations. Uh, let me take a stab at this one uh, for a minute. Uh, Jason said, uh, <laughs> in 2016 in February, I pulled out money from the business that I was running with my father. He pulled out about 30 grand, he says. He did this to make sure he got paid because apparently he wasn't getting paid at the time. So he took the money and he used it as income for himself. Fast forward to January this year, um, his business partner who had been running the business um, went bankrupt and he didn't file tax returns or anything. And he's trying to, you know, Jason's trying to figure out his best plan going forward uh, regards investment, taxes, new products, the company, you know, all that other stuff. So this is, not all that unusual. We get it all the time. People come to us with a scenario, right? This is what's happened so far, and this is kind of what I want to try and do. What's the best way to accomplish that? Well, the best way to accomplish that is probably to reach out to Ayana and set up a, an appointment to chat for a few minutes because there's going to be lots of um, questions about what you know, what the needs are, what you've done so far, what you still need to do. And then more importantly, we can probably point you in the right direction. So for example, in this case, um, you probably need to take a look at what uh, bookkeeping you have or what bank statements or bank accounts you can get. Did the bankruptcy include um, any of the business assets or not? Who, who was on the hook for those? Those kinds of questions we're going to ask and get answers to, and then we're going to be able to you know, give you some uh, advice or point you in the right direction in terms of how you could proceed 
And that may involve us hooking you up with a CPA or hooking you up with a lawyer to get some professional, you know, competent professional advice. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, we're happy to help with, uh, Jason. And, and, you know, other people that find themselves in precarious or weird or oddball situations, that's fine. Um, I've found myself in weird and oddball situations before. Who knows? It's possible that uh, uh, we've already had to deal with this in the past. Um, <clears throat> somebody's asking, this is Suzanne asking if we can change the social security number to an EIN with Amazon after we set up an S-Corp. And <laughs> I did cover that in detail on the last webinar, but let me tell you again, no. You, Amazon doesn't allow a change for the most part. Now it's possible that you could talk them into it somehow uh, to change from a social security number to an EIN. But for the most part, it's against their terms of service. They do not allow you to sell a seller central account and they do not allow you to change from one tax owner to another. Now having said that, you can still set up the S Corp. You can still get the EIN and run the S Corp and you can still use your seller central account, even though it's tied to your social security number. You can assign it to the S Corp yourself by putting the S Corp's bank account and debit or credit card on file with Amazon so that all of the activity goes through the S Corp. Uh, if you do that, the only thing that will happen is that Amazon will send, if you do more than $20,000 a year in business, Amazon will send to the IRS a statement, let's say you did a million dollars, and that statement is going to be attached to your social security number. That's fine. You get the statement, you hand it to your CPA or whoever does your taxes, and you say, this is under my social security number, but it's all business income. It's all business related. Your CPA will then on your personal taxes will show the million dollars of income and then million dollars going right back out to the business and then the business claiming that same million dollars as income. That way you don't personally end up paying tax on it. So that's the workaround. It's not too complicated and it's just done once a year. Everything else is just fine. So I wouldn't worry too much about that situation. I would just go ahead, set up the S Corp um, get it uh, up and running and if you can just change the bank account and the debit card over to that that belongs to the S Corp then you're in good shape. All right so a lot of people saying thank you um, you're certainly welcome everybody um, uh, Jason's asking do you manage your S Corp books on a monthly basis as well as the LLC level? Yes uh, not only do I manage my S Corp books on a monthly basis, I have lots of LLCs. Each LLC uh, owns a different project, like you know, a family business or a real estate project or a, a seller central account or a, some other uh, activity. Okay, so each LLC, yes, a separate set of books, and I also can take that separate set of books for each one of those and merge them into a single consolidated financial statement so that I can see the overall health of everything I'm doing. And then I can look at the individual financial statements for each one of those lines of business and evaluate them and see if any of them needs attention or if any of them needs to be killed off or if any of them is really going gangbusters and I need to pay more attention to the growth aspect. So all of those things, yes, I do that on a monthly basis, and so should you. All right. <clears throat> um, I think it's about time to uh, to to kind of perhaps start jump. wrapping things up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, about uh, losing my voice here. I, I've, I've for the last hour and forty five minutes, I've given the best I can give, and I hope that it's uh, something that benefits you guys. I thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to stick with me here. Yes, and, and very important information. I'm sure everybody here, uh, this is another session that I'm sure everybody's going to go back and watch again. I'm already getting lots of messages saying, when can I watch this replay? Um, so yeah, yeah. This, this was great, high-level, you know, <laughs> real business information. Um, this isn't the, the, like you said, Reed, this isn't the, the sexiest thing in the world, and that's why almost no one talks about it. Uh, this is, you know, critically important uh, to running a business and so few people talk about it. So I thought it was an enlightening session. Uh, love seeing your, your spreadsheets and your 90-day cash flow uh, projections. Love to see how you do that. 
Um, so I think people got a very good view of how your books can operate and, and how they can direct better business decisions and more profitability um, and, and the avoidance of major mistakes uh, just through actually knowing uh, what these what these numbers go up to. So um, yeah, incredible session. And guys, this is another thing. Um, just like last week's session, you know, you don't want to know everything about bookkeeping. It is, uh, I think, this is a subject that you want to know a little bit more about than than LLCs and S corps and things like that. Um, but this is something that you're going to outsource. Again, the way I always think about outsourcing is if the customer was running this company, you know, what does the customer care that we are doing? Um, you, you know, at the end of the day, if you're selling products on Amazon, your customers don't care who's doing your books. If it's you, if it's your son, if it's uh, someone, you know, outsourced, whatever it is, uh, your customer doesn't mind. They would much rather you outsource that piece of your business and spend more time building a better purchasing experience for them. So it, it really is something that does need to be outsourced by pretty much every business owner. And um, the, the real question is just when do I outsource that? And I, I personally think that once you are, you know, money is coming in and out of the door, that's the right time to get your book set up because it's actually very difficult. It's a misleading amount of difficulty. You wouldn't expect it, but it is very difficult just to feel out if you're making money or how profitable certain products yeah. are and things like that. Fly by the seat of your pants. A gut instinct. Yeah, I think I'm making money. I got money in the checking account. That's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> and that, that works no. for a while, you know? That works for a while. But once once the transactions really start piling up and three months in, six months of transactions are piled up, a year of transactions are piled up, your, your memory starts to fade from those transactions. And when as more and more order, in, man, I've been selling. I'm almost sold out. Am I going to have enough cash to reorder? Or when should I reorder? When can I reorder? I mean, if you look at yeah. I need a cash flow, that'll help you with that. So, yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm all of a sudden... All of a sudden, all the time that you saved not doing your books is going to get eaten up just trying to get those books back in order so you can make that one decision that needs to well, be made now. So you yeah. may miss the window, too. It may take you long enough to get everything put together that uh, you, you miss an opportunity. And that's also happened to me before. You know, didn't have it ready, so I couldn't, couldn't take advantage of it. But at the end of the day, um, if you're prepared, you will succeed, and that's, that's really what we're looking for. Uh, and yes. Lisa, you are welcome. Uh, Sue, you're welcome. Uh, David, you're welcome. Um, Byron, you're welcome. Um, he says, I'm both inspired <laughs> and hopeful. Well, that's good. We want you to be inspired and hopeful. Uh, great comment, Byron. Thanks. Uh, Cam Camilo says, thank you. Frank says, uh, amazing information. Um, can we also get the three-month cash flow Excel sheet? Wow. You guys want everything, don't you? Rotten and dry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll give that one to you too. We'll we'll give you both of those. No problem, Frank. We'll take good care of you. Uh, Aaron, you're certainly welcome. Edward, you're welcome. Everybody, you're welcome. All of you who have uh, hung in there with us, thank you so much for your time. And uh, Will, back to you. Um, I'd yeah. love to get the link on this replay. I know some people that need to see this that probably weren't on there, and I, I want to send this link out to some folks too. So shoot it over to me when you have it and make sure everybody else gets it, and I will... Um, after this is over, you and I will put our heads together and I'll get you uh, uh, clean copies of those spreadsheet templates that you can uh, uh, distribute to your folks. All right. That sounds great. And uh, Jason, I think you got the last question here. I'll make sure to answer that before we wrap up here. And, um, and yeah, I certainly know a few people that need to see this too. Honestly, this is stuff that every business owner needs to see, whether you're running an e-commerce business, a hair salon, or you know whatever it is, this is just absolutely critical uh, business knowledge for any entrepreneur or business person. So look forward to getting this uh, replay out to you guys. And once again, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, this was our second session now with Reed Larson from FBA Prep. Uh, we're going to have Reed back once more um, next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And um, Reed has, uh, again, I, I said this last week, but w Reed has just such a wealth of knowledge in so many different areas of this business and such a diverse and, and rich business background in general. So you guys have really seen a lot of Reed's business knowledge here. Um, next week, we're going to jump on Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, and Reed's going to show off some of his Amazon-specific knowledge as well. Um, he's going to go over the listing creation and optimization um, kind of flowchart and how, how those listings are made, how the keywords are chosen, 
um, and how those listings are optimized over time to drive the conversion rate up, drive more revenue out of the same amount of traffic. So, um, so we're going to go over that next week, and I'm very much looking forward to that session as well. So you guys got a good dose of kind of this foundational business knowledge from Reed, and next week we're going to jump in with Reed once more and uh, go over how he creates and optimizes sales or uh, product listings. And I think you'll see that just as much um, time and effort and um, and data went into that as all these other things. So Reed, it's been great hanging out with you uh, both today and last week, and we look forward to having you back next Tuesday. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. So thanks, man. Thanks for being here. And uh, I'll make sure to get in touch with you and get all these bonuses and things like that for these people and get that replay over to you uh, ASAP. Awesome. Looking forward to it, Will. Thanks again for the opportunity. Great. All right, guys. Well, thanks for being here. Hopefully you got a ton of value out of your time spent here today. I know I did. And uh, this replay will be up within a couple hours, so you guys can start re-watching this. Um, and, and I'd highly recommend that, especially with some of um, guys, there are not many people out there that have taken bookkeeping and accounting to this level where they're really making projections in the future, 90-day cash flow projections. I, I just love that so much. So uh, this is a great session, definitely worth watching again, and we will get that replay out to you within a couple hours. And other than that, guys, uh, I will see you next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our next bonus session. Uh, Reed Larson will be back talking about listing optimization and creation. Um, and guys, if you if you do want to get in touch with Reed, uh, it, we said this last week and it almost backfired on us. Um, Reed has some availability in his calendar right now. After last week's session, there were so many people that reached out for personal help that uh, I, I know Reed's calendar is just about full right now. So it's going to be first come, first serve again. I think there is some availability throughout this week. So if you want to just get in touch with, uh, with Reed at FBA Prep, and kind of piggyback on his bookkeeping and use um, you know, the bookkeepers and accountants that he's already trained up and everything, uh, make sure you email ayana at fbaprep.com. Again, I know there are not many um, calendar slots available, so make sure you get in touch ASAP. That is going to be first come, first serve. And, uh, and with that, guys, I guess we'll call it a wrap. So thanks again for being here. I will see you next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our next bonus session with Reed. Until then, guys. Take some action on this stuff. Don't let it uh, don't let it fade away. While it's fresh, take action. Uh, whether that's setting it up yourself or outsourcing it, make sure you take action soon because obviously that is the only thing that can transform this knowledge into real value for your business. But all right, guys, I will stop ranting now. Thanks again for being here. Much love to you all. I will see you on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for our next bonus session. And once again, thanks to Reed. Uh, just a a wealth of business knowledge here, and it is. Very necessary stuff that not many people talk about because it's just not the sexiest thing. So this was critical information. And once again, just want to say thanks to Reed for being here. So we'll see you guys back here next Tuesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, and you'll be getting this replay within a couple hours. Thanks again, guys, and I'll see you next Tuesday.